May 17th of 2022. This is a called work session of the Richland One Board of Commissioners. Do have a statement to read that pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act, which is FOIA, the public has been provided access to this live stream of the meeting via the district's website at www.richlandone.org, as well as in person with limited seating. We do have one item on the agenda. We will call the meeting to order with one item on the agenda, which is the reapportionment map, which is going to be presented by Attorney Williams. What's the pleasure of the board? Move for approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Bishop, and it's been seconded by Commissioner Myers to adopt the agenda. All those in favor say aye. We'll be open the floor for any questions or discussion. Aye. Aye. Question or discussion? Okay, seeing none here, now we'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those that oppose say nay. Ayes have it. We are now in session with one item, 4.1, reapportionment map. Attorney Williams, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone, school board members, Dr. Witherspoon, and others that are attending today. Um, you will be presented with um, a map that has been prepared for the district to look at to see if anything needs to be done with it to ask any questions that you may have. We have had um, attorney Joey Opperman, who is working on his laptop so that the picture can be shown um, that way as well. We also have attorney Imani Newborn with the Borkin and Davis Law Firm, and they have been working on this for the district, and this will be shared with you, this information today, and feel free to ask questions that you may have. Um, for your information, um, this has to be done periodically, approximately every 10 years. However, Richland One did this five, six years ago, but it's time to do it again, and then we should be back into that 10-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's because we have district seats that that is required. We have three at-large members, and four of you are in districts. And so because of that, it is necessary to look at the districts to make sure that, that they are such that there's an appropriate um, number of individuals in each of the seats that you vote upon. And so they should be ready shortly. Um, we can, if they're ready. Okay, they're not quite there. Imani, do you want to start? Okay, um, attorney Imani Newborn will start um, sharing some information with you all and then um, Attorney Opperman will um, actually go through the maps as well. Go all the way down. Good afternoon, everyone. It's on there. Um, for all of us to be here today, my name is Imani Newborn. I'm from the firm of Quicken and Davis. Not the seats. Not the seats. Mm -hmm. That's the proposed plan. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a pleasure being here. My name is Imani Newborn. I'm with the firm of Boykin and Davis. Um, I'm here in place for Charles Boykin. For, unfortunately, he had a family emergency. Um, so we're proceeding without him today, but he wants to send um, his regards. Um, so we're here today for, re for um, to redraw the line for District 1. Um, and according to the 2020 US Census, there's been um, population loss in North Columbia. Um, and there's been a population growth in downtown Columbia um, due to um, various factors. It's been um, a lot of growth um, with the, the college um, students with a little transient population. Um, there's been um, a, um, a growth due to, to various factors. But that's the issue um, that we have that we're presented today. I think if I if I'm, um, recall correctly, there's been about a growth of about 1,500 individuals in downtown Columbia. Therefore, there's a need to um, increase the growth in District 1 um, and also reduce the, the population growth or the population as it stands now in District 2 and 3. So um, we've um, assisted, I think, the, 
the district in the past with redistricting in the past few years. Um, and we called upon um, Joey Opperman, um, who is a STEAM professional. He's done a lot of work with the City of Columbia earlier this year with um, Kershaw County. Um, so he's our professional that we've consulted with um, to assist us in this endeavor. Um, and I'm going to give him the floor. We just want to make sure that we comply with the constitutional requirement of one person, one vote. Um, and we want to make sure that we, we um, redistrict um, or draw the lines, redraw the lines um, in pursuance to that con you know, um, constitutional requirement. And we wanted to make sure that we made the minimal changes that we could possible and still be in compliance. So I'll give the floor to Joey. Thank you, Imani. And um, I beg your pardon for starting a little late in our, our technical difficulties. And thank you for your patience. I'm going to briefly uh, review uh, the need for the changes that we, we are, are proposing, uh, why we did that, and a little bit of the, the legal uh, principles underlying that necessity. Um, I want to start out briefly with uh, the current school board map and illustrate that. Oh my goodness, here we go. Gonna have some difficulty. It's grown. That should be the video. Okay. Uh, yes. The, now this is the the current uh, the current map, um, and we'll scroll down a little bit just to illustrate that. Um, I think what this is going to demonstrate is that the the changes that are proposed are minimal which is appropriate given uh, a fairly small population growth and change. Uh, and you all are, will be familiar with, with your respective seats in the single member districts uh, in Richland 1. But this is a current map uh, for those who are watching at home or who are present and would like to look further. This map is available on the website of the South Carolina uh, Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office. So it's publicly available. This is the current map. Okay. We're going to look at um, an Excel spreadsheet for 2010. Uh, it's down there at the bottom there, Richland 1, 2010 stats. What I want to do is illustrate the population as it was when the map was adopted based on the 2010 census, compare with the current population based on the 2020, 2020 census to demonstrate the necessity for the changes that are proposed. And Joey, if you can take the mic and just angle it up a little bit more to you, there you go. Thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate apologize. that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Y'all uh, hopefully will be able to see here on the spreadsheet. Um, in 2010, these are the, the census numbers for the districts that currently govern. Um, so. At that time, according to the 2010 uh, census, the population of seat one was 49,727, seat two, 50,565, seat three, 52,394, and seat four, 48,842. Uh, you'll notice in the column deviation percentage. Um, case law interpreting the requirement of one person, one vote generally finds that a deviation percentage, in other words, uh, deviation from mean district size, um, if the deviation percentage from that mean district size from the largest district by population to the smallest district by population is less than 10%, uh, absent unusual or extraordinary circumstances, keeping that within 10% is going to be compliant with the one person, one vote principle. The only exception would be for a U.S. House plan because the Constitution requires that those districts be uh, as precisely equal as possible. All other districts, generally speaking, a 10% percentage of deviation is going to be acceptable. If we got beyond 10%, we would be in trouble. So let's take a look at the 2020 stats for the current districts. Uh, yeah. That'll be uh, up, up at the top, Richland 1 benchmark, Excel, yeah. So this is uh, current districts with current population. 
the 2020 population rather than 2010 population. What you'll notice for deviation percentage is that due to a change in population, uh, the deviation percentage from the smallest district by population to the largest district by population has exceeded 10% due to growth uh, in district population or changes in district population over the last 10 years. Because that percentage is over 10%, the district is currently at risk um, uh, for non-compliance with one person, one vote. In order to become compliant, we will need to bring that deviation percentage at least under 10%. Um, uh, so moving on, I want to uh, illustrate the stats for the proposed map, and then we'll look at the proposed map. Yeah, that one. So the proposed map, um, th these are the stats. We've got that right. That should, that, that should be, yes, that should be accurate. So the, the, the deviation percentage uh, has been brought down. This may reflect an earlier draft, but it's substantially um, similar to what, what we have with the proposed plan. Uh, that, that appears to be accurate. Um, oh, I see what's, what's going on here. I, Guys, I didn't update the cell here at 1.68%, but what you can see here is that the smallest district has a deviation of 2.88%. The largest district by population has a deviation of plus 2.06. So what that means is the, um, the deviation percentage is gonna be something like 0.495 or 0.496, a little under five, which is very good because you know, if you're under 10, you're fine, but we should be keeping it under five. Mm -hmm. um, the, the cell just hasn't been updated here. My apologies for that. Uh, now we'll take a look at the proposed map and talk about the details of that. And I'll try to keep that as brief as possible, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, I think so. I'll start out with the overall map and then we'll go district by district. The goal here is to, one, comply with the one person, one vote principle by making sure that deviation in population size doesn't exceed 10%. But in the context of doing that, follow all other relevant uh, laws governing redistricting. For instance, um, while due to the Shelby County versus Holder case, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is no longer applicable upon election law changes for Richland 1. In other words, this plan would not have to be submitted for preclearance to the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act does apply. That means if under the Voting Rights Act statute, uh, a jurisdiction in South Carolina or any other place diluted the vote of a protected <coughs> minority group in that jurisdiction, then a plaintiff could sue that jurisdiction in federal court and ask for relief under the Voting Rights Act. So it's been important for us to ensure that we're complying with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. It's also important, uh, conversely, uh, that race not be a predominant motive in the way the district lines are drawn. Race can be something that informs decision making here as a factor. Indeed, it's necessary to comply with the Voting Rights Act but it must not, cannot be the predominant factor as that would violate the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And we've taken great care to ensure that we um, have not uh, run afoul of either the Voting Rights Act or any constitutional prohibitions in drafting the proposed map. Uh, now, here's what I'd like to point out. Let's make this a little bigger. Seat one was the smallest seat. It needed to pick up population. Mm. Seat three by population was the largest seat, needed to pick up population. Seat two and seat four were about right. Unfortunately, uh, because seat two is the only district bordering seat one currently, seat one had to pick up all of its population that it needed to pick up in order to be mm. compliant from seat two. As a result, uh, seat two needs to pick up population. 
Well, that works out because three needs to lose population. Four was right at the sweet spot. So we recommend no changes whatsoever to seat four. It's right at where it needs to be. I think it's off by 44 people. So four is fine. So what the, the changes have done is add to one from two and add to two from three. Um, I'll zoom in just a little bit and we'll look district by district. It's recommended that to add the required population to one, um, Ward 30, which corresponds to the Arsenal Hill neighborhood in the city of Columbia, be added to seat one. Why? Because there's other places that you could pick up. Mm -hmm. Ward 30, which again corresponds to the Arsenal Hill neighborhood, is zoned for Columbia High School, much like this portion uh, of what's already in seat one uh, between the rivers, uh, west of the Broad River. So the Broad River Corridor, the St. Andrews area, that's all Columbia High School. Mm -hmm. By selecting Ward 30, we pick an area that's already zoned for the same high school as those students and families that are in seat one. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed a logical decision. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, now for seat two to compensate for that loss because Ward 30 is a fairly substantially populated district. There's a lot of growth there as, as, as in the rest of downtown. Uh, there were a couple of options. The, the goal was minimal change, so it was, did not seem desirable to significantly change the configuration of either two or three. The solution that seemed best was to split one precinct just one. And if you look at a lot of other school district maps around the state, um, you'll see split precincts all over the place. Best I can tell, this is the only split precinct in the plan, uh, unless you look at um, those precincts bordering a district boundary, like with Richland 5 or, or Richland 2. So why did we split Ward 1 and where did we split it? Let me illustrate. Oh, I can see. Because splitting a precinct, generally speaking, if you can avoid it, is not desirable. The way we split Ward 1 was to ensure that the University Hills neighborhood, a well-established um, neighborhood with objectively defined boundaries uh, through the city of Columbia and the Columbia Council of Neighborhoods. This is, by the way, the neighborhood map from the city of Columbia. We wanted to avoid splitting the University Hills neighborhood if possible. That minimizes the damage of splitting a precinct. So effectively, that portion of Ward 1, which corresponds to the University Hills neighborhood, remains in seat 3 as it has been. That portion of Ward 1 uh, that is west of University Hills uh, goes into seat 2. And what is that? Well, that's pretty much the horseshoe, the area around the state capitol. So you're talking about Cornell Arms, some apartment buildings on Senate Street, and students on the USC campus. That, that comports with a minimal change policy as well as um, very few uh, uh, residents and families in that portion of Ward 1 have students uh, in Richland 1 schools. So that's the change on the boundary there. The final change was by doing that, by adding Ward 30 to seat 1 and by splitting Ward 1 between 3 and 2 along the University Hills boundary line, the compactness that existed in the prior map, which was quite good, was somewhat diminished with Ward 30 coming down here, um, this little bit of Ward 1 going into seat 2. Uh, to address the, the slightly diminished compactness, um, Fairwold, which I think previously had been in seat 2, goes back into seat 2. Uh, previously, Greenview and Fairwold were part of 1, and that created a sort of dog leg shape from 1 coming into two here. Mm -hmm. Given these changes, uh, that uh, rather non-compact shape was not necessary any longer. So Fairwold is restored to seat two. And those are the changes. That's it. Seat one adds Ward 30. Man. Gives Fairwold to seat two. Seat three splits Ward one with seat two. So seat two loses Ward 30, gains Fairwold, mm -hmm. gains the USC and state capital half of Ward one. Seat three loses the USC and state capital half of Ward one while maintaining University Hills integrity. Seat one loses Fairwold but gains the much larger precinct of Ward 30, which corresponds to the Columbia High School uh, zone. Mm -hmm. Those are the changes. 
Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so very much. At this time, we'll open the floor for any questions from any board member. And thank you for the My presentation. Pleasure. Commissioner Devine. Thank you, Commissioner Harris. Thank you, uh, Mr. Opperman, for this. Uh, for these maps today, these are the proposed maps. Just one question: Will any of these proposed maps uh, prohibit voting practices that that may result in citizens being denied access to political practices on the account of race, color, or membership in a uh, large minority group? No, sir. Absolutely not. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bishop. These that, maps will that, that, be uploaded. These maps will be uploaded to the district website. Correct. Um, upon request, yes, ma'am. Okay, and and we will have to go through hearings, correct, Mr. Carlin, Miss Attorney Williams. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about the budget. <laughs> Attorney Williams, we will need to share this information so people will know okay. and be aware of what's going on. Okay, all right. Let me continue with the panel, with the board. Any other additional questions, uh, uh, Commissioner Lomanac? Thank you, Chairman Harris, uh, Mr. Auburn, I just. This is my first time, so I've yes, tried to educate myself best I can. Um, my understanding is when you go through this, you you have some principles that are trying to guide yes, the sir. process. Yes, That's correct. Clearly, I've heard the words uh, compactness, attendance zones, and voting precincts. Uh, try not to disturb those too much. Or, or, were there any other principles that you haven't specifically mentioned that went into kind of shaping this? Generally speaking, minimal change. Uh, minimal change is a good redistricting principle. The only circumstance, in my opinion, where it would not be appropriate is if a pre-existing plan uh, was already non-compliant in some way. So if you don't change a plan that's already screwed up, that's a problem. The good thing about Richland 1 plan is that it, it was already very compactly drawn and shaped. So we felt comfortable and safe pursuing a minimal change strategy. That was part of it. Um, the, the, the hope was not to split precincts. That can be confusing for voters to the extent that we did. It pursued a minimal change policy. One other aspect of this change here is, while there's a lot of population in the added portion of District 2, uh, there tend not to be a large number of voters because it mostly corresponds to the university and university students who don't typically vote in school board elections. The value of that is it's less likely to be disruptive to people. People are less likely to switch from one member to another. That, that that um, was part of an overall minimal change strategy. All right, and we're talking about total population, not not. I know a few states have used voting population, right. but that's not generally South what South Carolina. It's uh, you look at total population okay. for one person, one vote compliance, and you would look at voting age population percentages for Voting Rights Act compliance. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chairman Harris. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions, Commissioner Bishop? Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yes, sir. And I don't want to reduce anything you said, but I want to make sure the public is definitely clear. There's a difference between the redistricting and rezone. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, to, to the extent that school zones affected this process, it was simply that in adding something to seat one, since we had to, we wanted to, if possible, add an area that corresponded to high school students and yeah. seat. We, we didn't want to add from another high school. It keeps it a little bit more direct and compact that way. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn. Hi, uh, thank you, Attorney Opperman, yes, uh, for that presentation. Um, my question is along the lines of, I think what uh, Commissioner Devine brought up, and you know, he went for, I guess the one side of it. But I want to, I wanted to get your opinion about the um, democracy, you know, the participation, um, in making sure that uh, voters, you know, with this proposed map uh, that this is optimal, you know, participation, democracy will be, you know, the the key goal here. Um, as far as what went into proposing this map and drawing the lines, uh, can you go into a, just a brief description on, you know, what went into making sure optimal participation um, is acquired here? Yes, ma'am. Well, in this instance, minimal change seems to serve the goal of um, maintaining high participation. Uh, sometimes the biggest problem you see with participation in school board elections in South Carolina is because a lot of people will go in and vote 
straight R or straight D, mm -hmm. they don't then go down and vote for nonpartisan races like school board. Yeah. And so oftentimes you'll see lots of undervotes for school board. And there, there's not a whole lot you can do with redistricting to affect that. But the issue of folks not knowing who their board member is, is something to take into account there. In order to avoid large numbers of people being in a different seat, perhaps not knowing who their board member was, um, a minimal change strategy seemed appropriate in this circumstance so that uh, only voters in the Arsenal Hill area in Ward 30, the Fairwold area, and the USC portion and capital portion of Ward 1 uh, experience any change. Nobody else does. It's the, the disruption in knowing who your member is or what seat you're in that can perhaps negatively impact participation. And that's very specific to school board elections because Again, you do have that issue, and it's not just in Richland 1, it's around South Carolina that participation in a school board election tends to be a little lower than overall participation because of folks hitting that straight D or straight R and then not voting down ballot for nonpartisan elections. So we felt that minimal change as a policy would be least disruptive to uh, broad participation in elections. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Commissioner so, Lomonet. Uh, Chairman Harris, just to you, are we going to have a couple minutes to ask Ms. Williams about the process going forward in terms of county delegation and all that stuff? That is actually next. I just okay. wanted y'all to, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to get to the next. I want to make sure that he yeah, wasn't the one I should ask that question. Right. Okay. We're going to do the next steps in, in, in just a minute. I just wanted Joey to be able to answer any questions that we have on the actual proposed map. And then if everyone has asked their questions, then we can talk about the next steps. So Thank are there you. any additional Okay. Well, we'll go to uh, Commissioner Lomanek's question. Next steps. Um, there, we are required to have two public hearings, uh, and then we have to have two votes as a board. Um, we can attach those public hearings to our board meetings, correct? And I think that would be yeah. serve a little bit more convenient for... Is it one public hearing and two readings? That's what we did last time. We Attorney did. Williams. No, we had two. Because we did one in Columbia, then we did one down at Hall Hill. Okay. We I'm did sorry. two. Go ahead. Can you explain that, Attorney Williams? I know you're behind the sign, but we can hear you. Who that sign? Is it two public hearings? Bishop, we did two. We did two, didn't we? Yeah, I think we did two. I, I, I recall doing two in 2016. Yeah, in 2016, we did two. But we're fine with doing two. I think that's right. 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 More than area. right. 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 And and the goal is to attach um, the the public hearings to the beginning of our board meetings. Mm -hmm. um, that way, it it serves at a convenience. So those public hearings will pretty much be held here at SAB because our board meetings are here um, for the duration of the summer. So the first public hearing, um, Attorney Williams, will be on the twenty fourth, and it will be attached to um, the board meeting on the twenty fourth. So that would be the first one that we need to make sure we notice. So everybody clear on the next steps? Once, once we go through our public hearings and the board approves, at that time the map goes to our delegation and then they take it from there. Okay? Madam Chairman. Uh, yes. Very briefly, I had intended to briefly show zoom ins of each single member district. I can do that requested it would be very quick okay uh, but I anybody want to see that? that absolutely if we do it for the new guys sure <laughs> okay so and these are proposed so you could see this somewhat in the big map but this mm, it turned around right this would be seat one geographically it's large um, so the change here of course is that Fairwold goes into two um, and then Ward 30 comes from two into one. But broadly speaking, this district is north of 20 plus Greenview plus St. Andrews and Ward 30. And before it was um, substantially the same. Um, quick view of C2. Scroll down here. Broadly speaking, this is North Columbia, some of Forest Acres, and a little bit of downtown. To the extent it's changed, it picks Fairwold back up, which was previously in the district. That's right around in here. 
It loses the Arsenal Hill part of downtown. As you can see, very compactly shaped district. Um, and this is the, the Ward 1 portion we discussed. Um, do seat 3 real quick. The only change seat 3 experiences is the loss of the state capitol and horseshoe portion of Ward 1 including a couple of blocks of Senate Street and the Cornell Arms apartment complex, mm -hmm. but it's substantially the same. Uh, some downtown, Old Shandon, Shandon, Woodlands, Meadowfield neighborhood, uh, Kings Grant, some of Brandon, um, the Hampton Park neighborhood, Brandon, uh, Brandon Acres, Cedar Terrace, Lake Catherine, um, Kilbourne Park, Melrose, and um, I'm blanking on the name, it's Ward 15, I'm blanking on the name of the neighborhood, but it's substantially the same. And seat four is exactly the same, but I'll briefly uh, illustrate that. Seat four was Lower Richland plus Olympia and Ward five, and Ward five is pretty much Olympia, some of the Vista, and uh, Granby Park. That's what it was before. That's what it is now. It hasn't changed because the population was just on target. And Lower Richland plus Olympia is a pretty good, uh, compact uh, community of interest. Um, it's, it's just well done as it is. And um, a positive thing that there wasn't any need for change because it corresponds to a distinct community within Richland County and Richland 1. If we had them gals and chickens. That's all I got. All right. Thank you so much for that presentation. Any additional questions at this time? Seeing none, hearing none. We have exhausted our agenda for today. Again, our first public hearing on the reapportionment map will be on uh, May the 24th here at uh, the Stevenson Administration Building. That time will be posted. Um, um, at a later time this week um, for everyone. Again, thanks to all of the commissioners for being here. Also, let the record reflect that Commissioner King is not present, um, so that will be documented. Uh, again, if there's no uh, objection from the board, we can consider ourselves dismissed. Thank you.